it's it's spatial isn't it it's um i'd sort of maintain and i think a lot of the people whose opinion i value and a lot of the artists i like will tell you that art is social um and that architecture is ill-defined if at best um you can't quite say that that is architecture that isn't architecture because for architects at least it's so holistic and so blurry um, and the art world from, you know, bearing in mind, this is an outside perspective at this point, I'd already studied architecture for three years. Mm -hmm. So for me, the art world is something that belongs in a world. The architecture world has a world, but it also is the world. Um, so you, you can't quite separate it out. I didn't think at any point I would end up having a career as a jobbing project architect in a big practice. Um, so once you kind of defeat that ambition or, or rather that purpose, you you suddenly make architecture work for you or whatever discipline it is um you know separate the pedagogy from the career um and suddenly the pe pedagogy is much bigger um i think architecture offers so much as well there's so much writing on it it's so philosophical it's so social um but it's also a craft it's about things made and put together mm -hmm. um, and it's just possible to i think look at much of the world through a lens of architecture without uh, consigning that lens to the interest of only a few, mm -hmm. you know. And what, what gave you that confidence? Was there something in um, in not having to be the project architect behind a screen in a big corporate practice? What what were the clues that gave you confidence that that's possible? Um, possibly going back to some early tutors. Um, I think honestly, through education, you do meet more architects that don't work typically because the ones who can make time to give back to education or to teach, uh, they're not gonna be the project architects working on the bigger schemes. So yes, you go to lectures. Yes, you'll hear from very great architects completing very big projects, but you don't often get much of their time. You get their time as it's presented to you um, as a professional. Uh, which is why this, you know, the projects you're currently doing right now with with me here is so valuable because you get that conversational thing. So the people you have conversations with in education, your tutors at, up to that point, they will have been uh, possibly working on tangential forms of practice anyway. Um, and I possibly I would venture that that's part of the zeitgeist of our particular kind of decade or two in architecture was blowing it all apart, um, recognizing that buildings aren't made by architects typically anyway recognizing that architects claim too much agency over the world that they don't really have um so there's quite a big fierce critique of the power of the architect going on all through the time that i've come into architecture uh, and with that critique comes a kind of freedom to therefore invent you know okay so i'm not going to be um necessarily answering my political ambitions through just doing architecture in a practice by building but i can certainly um draw together all the themes of my thoughts and whether it's writing talking exhibiting performing whatever you can somehow make a better expression of what it is you're anyway setting out to do mm -hmm. i think that perhaps is just the characteristic of the architects i don't i think a good proportion of architecture students don't um i mean well factually speaking they don't sit it out a lot of them don't finish the part three a lot of them don't end up as practicing architects and yet still find it a valuable thing to have done a, va a valuable debt to have gained um mm -hmm. for me i don't know we're a fiercely independent fiercely slippery character anyway i didn't really want to do what's expected of you at any point mm -hmm. um, again which i think comes from a particular moment of growing up Post Thatcher, Britain, independence, mm. self, um, um, you know, it's not looking out for number one. It, it evolved from that, but it evolves into um, being self resourceful. But so, also, in the, in the time when uh, we were studying together, there was that time when the Cameron Osborne Clegg changes affected the, you know, level of tuition fees and I mean, I remember certainly people from our year and generation, I don't know whether you were among them, that went to London to protest. I mean, that happened in Oxford as well. There, there was a storm on the Radcliffe camera, you know, 
uh, right at the heart of education and establishment, the sound system taken in on a trolley, desks stood on, books flung around, you know, statements made. Yeah, it was quite noisy, but honestly, I was very much um, around, but not, um, certainly not in the middle of that. It was quite apolitical back then, to be quite honest. I mean, there is a, I guess whether there is a certain legacy of that time that is now affecting architectural education is another question. Mm. And whether you see certain things that we as educators that we are today need to resist in, in the sense that um, education is changing to, in some way, explain the fees, right? To explain the, the tuition fees to the student. So, so I mean, I guess the question is really, you know, we don't need to go back to to the political developments over the past thirty years that have led to uh, where we are today. But maybe uh, your your view or position on where we are today and where we could or how we could challenge that position. Mm. I think um, it's nice being young in education because you're able to kind of hold your uh recent memory of how you felt when you were on the student side of the table mm -hmm. um and I, I do think there is value in having young teaching staff around for this reason because sometimes you feel like a little bit like the bridge between your older colleagues and your students um so what i would say i think there's quite a lot of apathy i i find and I really try and unpick this as a point of uh, interpretation or maybe my memory tricking me, but I'm sure we were more political when I was a student than they are now. Um, and I would put that if I if my suspicion is correct, and it's very narrow, obviously, it's a certain school in a certain country, etc. Um, I I'd put that down to apathy. Yeah, I think uh, we do feel less empowered. I think people are sort of less radical in action and more radical in opinion so they was sort of you're so absolutely fixed in your opinion you're happy to just say someone else is wrong and not actually go out and shout about it uh which might explain why there's riots in 2011 and not in 2023 um I, there's a there's a lot there's a common complaint you hear amongst educators myself my colleagues will say something like um well it's very transactional now students are paying for it so they expect it to look like this they expect it to result in that job i don't think young people actually think in those ways as much as we mm -hmm. say that they do mm -hmm. i honestly don't i think debt is a lot more abstract when you don't already have it i think anyway um there's still the kind of archetype that a student is broke and a student is a, a poor thing in pursuit of an art or a lot or a knowledge or a school of law. Um, mm -hmm. and I think even the most rational students kind of accept that archetype and that's what students are in our society. They're the people that are allowed to be kind of rock bottom, irresponsible, but in some ways productive. Um, and I think therefore, I don't think every single student I sit across is, is looking at me keenly and saying, right, how is this conversation going to, up my pay bracket I just don't think it's true I think some of them yes maybe courses that aren't an architecture maybe a part two compared to part one is a different conversation as well um, but teaching on part one course I think young people simply and you're allowed to change your mind you do change your mind they will change their minds um, maybe I'm you know position of privilege growing up very middle class maybe I didn't have the same concern choosing a core I mean who whoever like you say it's not an accident you're with a bunch of people that chose architecture mm -hmm. it's famously underpaid mm -hmm. it's famously long mm -hmm. um, and it's famously kind of broad so mm -hmm. you're already sitting in a pretty irrational crowd mm -hmm. um, who aren't going to have the same sort of career financial output motive um but i also think yeah i do think they're a bit more uh there's a bit more antipathy i think they're like yeah so be it i'm going to be poor it's mm. architecture i roll you know i think every um clique has this kind of self-deprecating again i probably sound very british right now but the self-deprecating um awareness mm. and in a way that's where confidence i like to think comes in quite powerful because you can be self-critical with confidence on that position yes. if, you, if you own your own your gloom and own your uh your right to moan at your own life um you can therefore kind of do it in quite a ballsy way because it's only your fault 
and you're you're sort of answering to yourself publicly. Mm -hmm. Um, all of which I think is beyond the typical um, thinkings of a 17, 18 year old applying for university in any case. When you, when you talk about the broadness of education and the length of it, I wonder at, at which point did you start to recognize some specific subjects or points of interest or lines of inquiry that you felt were potent and able to in form uh, where you're going to go next mm, this is an interesting one I think um firstly I talk about luck here I think um what I was I think the interest comes first I think you shape it you you find that thing in architecture that somehow mm, speaks you're already to, there yeah it's already there so you know I grew up in in Lewis where they celebrate bonfire night and it's a it's a big event spectacle there's a procession at the middle of it it's all fireworks it's all noise it's all extravagance and costume it's all in public space it's all at a certain townish scale it's all it happens every year presumably. it happens every year it's a, it's a british tradition um but in this particular town it's quite a big deal it's bigger than christmas they say um in in this town so going to university and sort of suddenly thinking oh maybe public space is more interesting than the insides of buildings um, that that might come from there talking about how architecture is galvanized when it's busy and and sort of less interesting when it's dead or quiet that comes from there um, you know just the recognition that people actually create the architecture there's something about finding Bernard Schumi in my undergraduate something about certain tutors like Colin Priest pointing me at, in certain directions along those lines um, you know without people there is no architecture so I, I i guess a kind of i guess if if i cared to i could map a linear trajectory from you know spot patterns in your childhood and find them in architecture but i think they're already there and i think you find them i could also have found other things and then you know the coincidence is that um in 2012 when i graduated um being all about acting out being all about uh self-confidence as a form of expression um about people playing, about these events, these uh, celebrations. 2012 in London is the Olympics and it's the year of play. So um, in my first job, I, the first thing I'm doing is writing a think piece on, on play in the city. So you, you could call that a big coincidence in, in a way. Um, three or however many years later, when I come to apply to the AA, which I, I can't afford, there appears uh, as if made for me this scholarship for a student interested in events and performance and and there I am ready with my CV perfect for the application so but saying so that I think there's chance but I also think you're you're already like I said architecture is so broad you, you're going to find what you look for um and if if there's a really good resonance if there's a really good chime um I think that's when you find passion I suppose without sort of sounding too superfluous and mm -hmm. perfect. Um, so you mentioned, you mentioned the growing up in Lewis and the, the bonfire being a sort of communal spectacle. Something that really impacted you or something that you enjoyed very much. But at, at what point did you realize that that's architecture? Whether I wonder whether you realized that the bonfire is architecture before you thought, I want to be an architect so i think much later i come to uh, came to appreciate that that in fact was the architectural act um writing about it probably yeah so you know um i also grew up enjoying watching grand designs on tv with my mum and um i thought architecture was about building and i like building stuff and that was great you know let's go and study architecture um at some point, like I said, there's a sort of resonance when you realize, hang on a second, this way more exciting thing that I was doing anyway every year, that's that's architecture. And then you sort of suddenly realize you, you can look around like a god and say, that's architecture, that's architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and it is so long as you, um, so long as you kind of derive a sort of, um, I don't know what from it. Yeah, that there is no word, but I, it was certainly afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it, maybe not everything is architecture. I'm not going to quite go that far. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, for the individual looking at the world and figuring out how people socialize and what brings people together, how people shelter, 
um, you know, there's not many definitions of architecture, but one of them is simply shelter. And you can shelter more than materially. You shelter in a society, you shelter in a town, you shelter in your own identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in that sense, I kind of, I guess at some point in my undergraduate, realized that in fact, um, a procession carnival, mm-hmm. you know, a yearly celebration, this is the most architectural thing I've ever seen in my life, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Re- yeah, realizing that again, the the best moment of architecture last year was this uh, queue for the Queen's funeral, because you, you suddenly look in the papers and there's a map with this line, and it's going from Westminster along the Thames, it ends up all the way in Greenwich, I think it's seven kilometers long, and you think what what in the world of architecture is, has united London like that in that kind of way, um, for years, you know, um, so. It's it's afterwards though. I think I sort of grew up thinking architects looked a bit like the people on Grand Designs on Channel Four, mm-hmm. uh, and latterly realised that there that's not true at all. Mm. It, it, there seems to be something about how we look at the world that um, is profoundly a a sign of being an architect. <laughs> um, you know, being able to see a certain situation or a cue to see the coffin as a piece of, well, I don't know if you want to call it architecture, but as a, as a but maybe, yes. I was talking to Neil McLaughlin two, two days ago, and, and it was interesting because he was talking about a very similar notion in his interest in sacred and religious. He was talking about um, the, the ritual how the ritual already exists and you know when you talk about the fire and when you talk about the queue there is something ritualistic about it and from his perspective an architect is there to just honor something that already exists Mm. which i felt was quite an interesting point of view but then but then it does require seeing that thing as a thing worth Um, acknowledging Mm -hmm. so this um, way of seeing the world in a different way so so I wonder how how has your uh, viewing of the world changed or evolved over the years and is there there something in recent times that you've um, started to see that you haven't seen before um yeah, I guess, uh, well, I'm only going to say the first thing that comes to my head. So later I'm going to disagree with myself and that's fine. Um, but I guess there's a kind of powerlessness that any individual has, which I think um, at the moment I like to uh, portend that that is wisdom coming into my mind, that I, I don't really affect the world. Um mm-hmm. I used to be a lot more ambitious, more egotistical when I was younger. And then you see something like the Queen's queue, for example, as as our um, our nom de jour. And you think, well, that's a seven kilometer line which unites half of central London and the River Thames and everything in between. Um, Who possibly has authorship over that? Add the dimension of time and you've just just got, you know, the, the collage city condition. Um, you, you don't have a, a master or a mastermind anywhere. Um, the ritual is a, a group endeavor. Mm-hmm. Someone will decide a particularity of it. Someone will misuse it. Or someone else will committee the shape of it as a whole. Other people will lead parts of it and other people will partake in it. Um, and I think the world is kind of getting bigger in that way. We understand from globalization and the way company structures work and um, even you know being part of an academic team in a university uh, you don't just go in and, and say right we're doing things my way you you chip and you you know you, you make incremental changes in incremental ways in incremental days of the week so I, th- I think um, all this amounts to just recognizing that you're much smaller than you think you are I think the bigger you get the smaller you get or the older you get the smaller you get um, and you start to enjoy the intimacy of what you do have close to you um, you start to recognize that you, you don't need to affect everybody. I'm obviously talking through my hat here because we've also living through the rise of the influencer and main mm-hmm. character syndrome and all of these kind of ideas that people 
do think their ego is is it is possible to spread their ego further and further and further and to influence more and more and more um which is why i uh, as a contrarian always will take the counter route and shrink my ego um as as a means to achieve wisdom instead which i would value more highly than um influence um but this is all quite sad really because um at the same time you do yeah we need we need the ambitious people amongst us we we need the people who are going to have the great ideas and I, I i do i am a sucker for a story whether it's reading you know about the great architects of yesterday or significant figures of the past there are certain moments where people do have an outward influence on others mm -hmm. me personally i i think um drawing it in recognizing that your actions are balanced and counterbalanced and misused and misrepresented and played with and that also gives me creative license to do that with everyone else's ideas mm -hmm. um so i i it's quite a depressing sort of answer to your question mm -hmm. uh in a sense um the great event in my my own life is having a new baby as well yeah. it's, uh three months in a week you just met him recently um but yeah you suddenly you can daydream at a baby's face uh and maybe nine years ago i would have kicked myself for not reading that book or watching that intellectual film or or making mm -hmm. that phone call to that person to arrange that job mm -hmm. uh, but it's kind of enough to to enjoy that simple thing but it also puts everything else in perspective and it sounds as if there is a processing of or, or in some way rethinking of the position that you find yourself in as a creative individual, as, a, as an educator. And I, I guess that's all we can do is to be comfortable in, in the place where we are. That's the only constructive way that will allow us to, in a way, get anywhere else. So, so how does this impact your attitude towards your creative work? I don't expect you to say that it's less important or or or, <laughs> or anything like that. Um, but what new perspective on the creative work does this new way of seeing, uh, as you described it, how does that impact that work? I guess. Um... I, I was watching um, um, a lecture on the um, AA YouTube online lectures, Mark Wrigley talking about sketches. It's very good. He he sort of talks about how uh, there's a teleological idea of the sketch and it, it, it's sort of the sketch is the sort of enlightened position the architect has um, and the similarity between a, a sketch and a moment you find in a completed built architectural work will prove that the architect was sort of divinely inspired to create this thing and it was only a means to an end um and any architect worth their salt will be measured by their sketchbook and it's it's quite interesting but he does make this i believe he makes this link with um because he's a very smart guy some some of it waves over you sometimes you're distracted by the the changing of a nappy or whatever um but there, there's a sort of expectation that the, the sketch itself, and the sketch is something I want to talk about a little bit, is um, uh, a means to an end. It's it's both evidence of a divine inspiration, but also kind of evidence that however you wanted to put something out, whatever the end product of a thing was, uh, you, you've kind of got this little signatory evidence that you saw it coming all along. Mm -hmm. um, so I was reflecting on that because I do like to sit and fill my sketchbook in the evenings. Um, and I think this maybe answers your question is the sketch always used to be a means to get to somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the younger me sort of with design build collective ambitions, you know, we, we would draw something up thinking, right, this will be built. And I, that that's pro possibly is a great power of a conventional architect. You know, um, you, you're making a squiggle and you yep. can see a building and that you know that's something i think architects should be trained in to some degree but projecting you... an outcome projecting an outcome exactly so quickly in a way and... yeah and and you're you're therefore the author of it you're in control of it mm -hmm. um however i think at some point the 
that completely undermines the power of sketch. If, if you're too busy thinking about the outcome, then what the sketch is more than evidence. It's more than a signature at the bottom of the project. It's that there's something powerful. I think that artists are capable of that architects aren't so much in being proud of the mess and proud of the process as an end to itself. Mm -hmm. Quite often I go and see art shows and I'll read the text and think what a load of nonsense that is because I don't see it there. And then I realize the architect doesn't, the, sorry, the artist doesn't care. Like the artist doesn't need to have that, that, that linear outcome evident between the sketch and the building, let's say, or between the, the thought and the idea or the idea and the project or the project and the interaction with it. Um, so I think for me, where the work is going is sort of let that thing be that thing you know, um, because you don't know what's going to happen to it. You don't know how someone's going to misuse it. You don't know quite what it's going to do in when it's outside in the world. Mm -hmm. You don't really know if it's a good idea or not. You, usually you, you sort of like something you do or you don't, and that's why you put it out there. Mm -hmm. But who, who's to say, you know, like, like I said, my, my ego is the last guy in this conversation, really. Maybe I put it out there and you love it, and I, I really don't. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the idea is more powerful because then we we do something with it. So being so predictive, being so um, uh, pedantic with your ideas, so controlling, I think is something I'm trying to overwork at the moment. Um, as a more concrete example, um, I make a lot of steel sculptures. I used to start my process by drawing uh, with pencil on a page. At some point, um, three, four years ago, I just stopped the sketch entirely. You start with two bits of steel in your hand, you stack them together, you get some magnets to hold them in place. You stand back, you look at it. It's the very thing you can't do as an architect unless you're a, a, a sort of uh, very well-resourced one-to-one -one designer. Um, you just can't do that. And I think I realized that I wasn't, you know, trying to sculpt as an architect was wrong maybe I should redefine what sculpting is. And sculpting doesn't rely on a sketch. It doesn't rely on an outcome. It relies on uh, a certain subservience to a material, a certain subservience to a mood, into the light, into the moment. But to a force of nature, gravity, et cetera. Yeah, you, you could counter this and say, this is what an architect is doing, but um, an architect has all too many considerations. Sculpt sculpture, for example, is so liberated from uh from a client from a purpose or it can be um um and logic as well I, I think yeah even as i speak i'm sort of in my head contradicting myself because there are great architects architectures which are illogical defy themselves but they're pretty rare things you know they're still drawn uh, they're still drawn uh, before they're constructed often um but but this notion that you begin to uh, to envision or or actually you're searching for it right you're 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 in space searching for an object hmm. um, so this idea of a uh, de determined or uh, this predetermined direction I think if you look at like the the event producer or the choreographer or or someone that isn't an architect using a sketch to evince an outcome, um, if you ask someone to draw Lewis Bonfire Night and stick to that as a design drawing, you you kind of they're going to be a bit baffled. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're rather rather going to have a list of addresses, email addresses, and a spreadsheet that says who needs to be where when doing their thing. Um, so there is a sort of a, an instruction, a, a taxonomy of materiality and action, and they are, um, yeah, le less less egocentric. You, you you take it out of your individual remit and you say, well, it's a balance of all these things. And yes, architects make spreadsheets, um, but I think there's a kind of bit of an arsiness amongst architects that demands that, yes, even if you... Um, work in practice in a big team with many consultants and you produce a decent building there nevertheless is this signature at the beginning the sketch mm -hmm. that saw it all coming and everything else was a means to an end mm -hmm. um, it is interesting that when you perhaps as an artist or, or as a person that conceives and makes the object uh, you almost have to have all of those voices internalized so 
there, there's probably a process of questioning every decision that it's done internally rather than externally and mm. i guess as you describe it there is something quite liberating about having your own conversation but having an internalized conversation but then at the same time i i don't want to say that there is a danger in that but i do want to question how can you trust yourself <laughs> it, it's a, it's because a, in, in if when when the conversation is external there is a, there is trust that has to exist between all the different parties um, but when it is internal you need to trust yourself and then maybe we get to the point of maybe talk about intuition which is perhaps the 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 act of trusting your um yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Sometimes the the studio at, at the scale of sculpting on a tabletop is a lonely place when you're coming out of practice and you're um, you're used to working as part of a team and having uh, design charrettes. And uh, where I worked at Erect Architecture, I would be side by side with Nozomi or Tom or one of my colleagues at some point and swapping drawings, you know, oh, can you ink this up? Can you put that in? Can you check my spacings on this? Can you do this? Can you do that? Um, and there's a great confidence, there's a great uh, teamwork, reliancy, you know, trust, that's what it is. Um, and usually it makes the work better. Um, so I, even as you're saying it, I'm completely agreeing, like how you, you're missing out so much when you, when you get to this kind of desk and you're alone with a couple of bits of steel and suddenly you're like looking around for someone to sort of share or, or voice this against. Um, it's true. So it's, I guess at some level, you don't want to 100% do either of those things. Mm -hmm. And intuition only gets you so far. It gets you to the point where uh, you're ready to share what it is you've been intuiting. Um, as, as such, you, you're in a dialogue with yourself. Because if someone, if you were putting pieces together in front of you, and, and if someone came and brought another piece from the corner of the room and said, huh, what about this here? And you sort of look at them and you think, no. <laughs> yeah, put um, that down. <laughs> so, you know, we are in the constant process of uh, justifying our decisions to ourselves and having that conversation. And, and in a way, building up a network of constraints or you know when I look at your pieces I always wonder how does he know when it's actually finished and and you know that this is an ultimate question of uh, in any form of art when is this piece finished and when I look at your work I did it and I'm just now looking at the one that's in my top right corner of my screen I, I can see a, a coherence in it but I do wonder at what point do you give it away into the world or to the world mm, this is um this is a question you could ask anyone isn't it and it, i think you could write it on that yeah. list <laughs> no i haven't thought about it so. no but it's a good one you could write it on that list of 10 questions to to break the yeah, ice when, you know, when, when is it finished full stop um or dot 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 rather ellipsis um I think it's, yeah, especially when you're trying to do less with I must your say that your work is specifically asking me to think about that. Mm. Uh, because okay. it's performative, uh, because it's, I would say, there is a degree of simplicity in it. And then I can see other works where I think you've elaborated more on certain fragments. And so, and so anyway, that's, that's why. Yeah, like, if you take, right if you don't take the work, but you take, uh, the catalogue or the ongoing work or, you know, the, the trajectory of the work. Um, it might be a nice moment to talk about um, some of the larger versions of these that have mm -hmm. um, been used in, in collaboration with Stefan Jovanovic in, in his dance works. Um, because I might intuit something, call it done to my satisfaction, um, but done to my satisfaction is with the expectation that it's going to be delivered into a a rehearsal studio and suddenly it's it's new and it's never been seen in it or touched or used yet and it's yet to be written this you know yet to be explored um so i think maybe i borrowed that lovely liberating idea from a couple of collaborations where the work was never was only a prompt you know a stage instruction 
an opportunity, let's say, a choreographic opportunity. Um, and now I sort of apply that thinking to everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's something in that, that, you know, I bring home little sculptures all the time and then realize that they make really good um, coaster for my beer, or uh, one of them has all my iPhone cables kind of neatly wrapped in inside. It's a very good cable organizer. Um, and I think, yeah, that there's a kind of hesitancy to call something finished ever. Mm -hmm. um, because even if like the, the one up here is a good example, because actually I think that does look quite finished because firstly, I bothered to paint it. I gave it three coats and it's a nice finish. Uh, secondly, it's very symmetrical. Coating is always a good way to finish it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, at that point, if you start welding again, you're getting some very nasty fumes. So, so paint is a good deterrent of, of future activity. Um, but the, it's very symmetrical. It's very, um, it literally is balanced, you know, um, mm -hmm. as a rocking object. Um, but then you might rightly look at it and say it's very nude. It's very, you know, there's not much to it. And actually, that's probably part of it. That's what in my work I quite like about working with tubular steel. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like a line, you know, mm -hmm. if actually I'm, I'm also looking at this object behind me on my screen mm -hmm. and my knowledge of the depth of it. Um, if you just see that as a flat, it could be a drawing on the wall in black line. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what steel is. I can't, sometimes I'm quite jealous of people who work with mass. I love the work of uh, Samu Noguchi, for example. Mm -hmm. Great carved things. He gets to take bits away. There's a real in, in, visible intuition of shape. Everything that you do with with a line, with additive process, is very contrived by contrast, you know, or it appears to be. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not very accidental. I didn't accidentally drop a bit of steel and weld it into place, you know, especially when it's so symmetrical. Yeah. Um, but I do think, yeah, that you know, a sketch isn't ever finished. Really, one of these things is never really finished because there's an anticipation that it's going to get taken down and someone's going to prod it and someone might sit on it and someone might fall off it. Maybe you could just explain a little bit the the prompts that you produced for Stefan's performances uh, or performance. Uh, the one that I've seen myself is the one Sadler as well. So I don't know if that's been done elsewhere. So at, at the risk of horribly confusing Stefan's work on his behalf, um, I think he is very much into ritual. Mm -hmm. um, but it, the piece was called Constellations, um, which is a name borrowed from a, a kind of idea of a therapy where um, you, you kind of act out the constituent parts of a situation in order to reflect on how you how you feel about it. So the choreography is very limited in that sense, in the way, same way I sculpt. So the choreography is not step by step spelt out. The choreography is an act of behavior between a group of dancers and objects that is worked on for a few weeks before it's before it's performed. Um, so at no point has Stefan written the choreography from start to finish down. Mm -hmm. However, he has developed the um, characters of each of the dancers and they have internally developed their character. You know, he quite often at the time was using these uh, the characters of the witch and the fool. Mm -hmm. um, the witch is a sort of pernicious um, character of intents um, and the fool is someone for whom the whole world is new you know mm -hmm. everything's a brand new encounter and they're impressionable um, so he briefed me to create a, a sort of playground for these gods of witches and fools um, so you know there's there is a it's a project so there's a budget um, there's a scale fitting any one of them through double doors at the back of the theater for example getting them all into one van um beyond that it i sort of sat down and tried basically to create prompts so there's a nice phrase borrowed from william forsyth who's a american chore choreographer and sculptor uh, the choreographic object um so he does all these delightful pieces where you might call it half finished work i call it you know i'd call it a choreographic object or a prompt um so I, I guess keeping it simple was the was the idea. I designed a piece that would roll. I designed a piece that would uh, move about on wheels. There's a ladder in there for the changing of height. There's a pendulum which swings above your head. Um, there's an asymmetrical spinning top which is able to uh, describe a circle. 
Um, so th there's definitely a lineage of playgrounds, which we haven't talked about at all, but Aldo van Eyck and my history of place-based design is absolutely running its course through these pieces as well. Um, but yeah, they're a set of five objects and they each move in a certain way. And for me, there's a kind of fairly clear way, oh, it's a big wheel, it rolls. Mm -hmm. um, the delightful thing is when you get it to the studio and you give it to the dancers and they're, they're starting their work where you think you're finishing yours because you've just, you've, you've been in a workshop for two weeks, you've been welding, grinding, oiling, finishing, delivering. Uh, and then they're there on day one, you know, stretching out like only dancers do. Um, and suddenly the wheel is pushed over onto its side and they're all climbing through it. And you're like, well, that was meant to roll around, but okay, I'm going to sit here and enjoy the rest. Um, so the, the, the show, yeah, the, the, the show, like I said, it was not, it's not sort of, I, I, I don't know why Stefan said there should be objects in it in the first place. He's a bit of a maximalist. There, there's objects, there's music, there's rituals, there's powders, there's masks, there's smells there's behaviors, there's transitions, you know, there's a lot going on. So it, possibly it's natural that there should also be a scenography or a set. Mm -hmm. um, so to my end, knowing that and working in very basic singular material, um, I don't really want to add too much more. So they're going to come out as these quite simple things and, and whatever they're used for, I couldn't really... I'm, I'm curious, so the, the objects, uh... The, the, the prompts, as, as you described them, they, they had a they had a trajectory of sorts in terms of being being conceptualized and made. Then they were used in the performance and, in a way, misused or used in a new way of giving a completely new. I wonder what happened to those objects after, or wh where are they now? Where are they now? Um, this is a good question. I think. Um uh yeah there, there's an anecdote i should probably mention here which i think has been mentioned by other sculptors before but it's something louise bourgeois said i think um when asked about sculpture by an interviewer she just said what does sculpture make you think about and she just said storage uh and it, it, you know living in london in 2023 space is non-existent so uh in short they lived for a little while in a small patch of unused space uh close to stefan's house in the kind of can we can't we let's just do it way uh they then moved to a, a yard belonging to my cousin Were they visible in all their glory in that space there yeah they actually one nice evolution of them as five different pieces in in a space at the, at the end of the show something completely unplanned was that they ended up being piled together into a sort of yes yes, yes, yes. a new object yeah yeah a new sort of uber object and and the uber object state was how they ended up being stored every in every spot. evening presumably the object looks different because yeah. this show took place what three evenings in a row yeah three three performances and three unique uber objects so yeah the the end of the piece comes and the characters start piling them up um so I mean, by now the one of them is is fifty yards away from me, squeezed into a tiny patch of front yard outside a terrace on Graham Road in Hackney. Um, one of them became one of them was. Really? Really, is well, it chained? It is quite... chained. Yeah, chained. It's sad, isn't it? Um, it's quite appropriate because it is like a tube, and you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might just roll away. I've I've been considering unchaining it. I couldn't bring myself to scrap it. I have scrapped a lot of work. You know, it lives in your studio for a while. It takes up space. You fill up your house with it, and then you fill up your studio with it, and then you give some away, and then eventually. Not to bring anything into my patio, Jack. You've got a perfect patio, yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take you up on that invite. So uh... yeah, it has to be good work, though. Okay, but I've got this on record. I'm not curious. I don't mind having a nice object in the middle. Great. Okay. Deal. Yeah. Um, I'll it give you some form of storage. Um, but yeah, a lot of it gets scrapped. And then, like I said, the work's never finished. That wheel, particularly, they say the, the sort of largest piece from Constellation's show was a big wheel. Mm -hmm. That thing has it's got so much mileage left in it. I, I plan to make a film with it, for example. Um, I want to do something a bit like... Um, going back to some older work of filming myself moving through the city with various encumbrances. Um, Andre Kadir was a, a, an artist that inspired me. He was the guy that walked everywhere with a sort of colorful wooden stick. 
Mm -hmm. used to crash other artists' shows and leave his stick leaning up on a wall. Um, and they have one of his sticks in the um, sort of performative objects collection at the Tate Turbine. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's many projects left in that wheel. It's just a big steel wheel. What could be more useful than a big steel wheel without any other, without any job to go to? Um, so it, from birthday parties to art film to future dance works to my my friend's empty patios, there, there's nothing. There's something very powerful about sculpture that can move and is not precious. Mm. You know, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's what's interesting about all that work is that you weren't you weren't actually designing the festival element of the work you weren't designing the, the the way in which the work will be used but if if we go back to if we go back to the work where the in a way the event came first i wonder how that process is different when we maybe compare that to the work that you did at daa with an inflated toad that mm -hmm. moved around the school went out of the windows and back in mm. um, I, I think this is very much, as you say, the event that the event needs to happen comes first. Mm -hmm. and it lands in my lap in a very heavy way. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to join an institution like this in with this sort of expectation on your shoulders, because so maybe we should just explain that uh, when you were awarded a scholarship to come to DAA, uh, the scholarship was sponsored by uh, Tate Towers. Tate. So Tate Towers is a massive entertainment company. Um, they're based in Leditz in Pennsylvania in the States. Mm -hmm. um, and they used to work a lot as one of their chief collaborative designers was Mark Fisher, um, who studied at, the a. studied at the A once upon a time, um, sort of contemporary of Archigram and did, did lots of incredible uh, performance work. Um, but also made a name making inflatables. So yeah, the condition of my scholarship is that I had to put an event on at the school while I was there, which is really nice, actually. I'm, I'm glad I was uh, put into that corner and made to do this. I think it's a good way of awarding a scholarship where it's a bit of a give and take. Um, so yeah, the, the event came first. I mean, the, the whole um, Toad project, for want of a better phrase. The official title was Round and Round the Old Kent Road, the Radical Rascal Ran. Um, but it was, there was a lot to it. I think uh, the project I was working on was about um, pilgrimage, in fact, and walking. Um, so there's the brilliant Belgian artist, Francis Alice, who's always been quite inspiring to me, um, doing lots of walks with paint, with ice, with goats, with whatever. Um, so I was working on a project about walking. I think just at the time this snippet was in the news about GPs prescribing walking for patients, mm -hmm. for depression, for clinical reasons, for bodily health reasons, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and I sort of had this question, can you walk out of a city anymore? Is it possible? Um, so the project site, therefore, was the old Kent Road, which was the old site of Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales. It's... Um, a site famous for being walked along to leave London. Mm -hmm. um, so I started playing this part of the pilgrim and looking at walking and walking as a form of critique and a, a sort of protest against scale and, and uh, also a search for delight and health and general well-being. Um, and then the event was therefore an invite to sort of play with ideas you're playing with anyway. So the idea of what a walk could do for an institution or a more internalized body of space um, and then you remember that I've spent my childhood going to procession events every year in, in Lewis at Bonfire Night. Um, it, it sort of felt uh, kind of obvious to me that I should uh, do some sort of scripted walk around the school um, and make a big noise about it. Um, the, I guess the other stuff that was going on, um, uh, the AA, as always, was having some kind of identity crisis at the time. Uh, I think the question of if it was truly radical or not was floating around. Um, David Green was critiquing all these fiefdoms that existed. Everyone was in the school busily doing their thing and no one was talking to each other. Um, so the, the walk and, and that... And plus, David Green was your tutor? He wasn't. Time. No, not directly. So in, in my second year, I was in Diploma 7 with Samantha Hardingham and John Walter. 
Okay, so it was it, the... a unit that he'd just the year before vacated, but he was up to all his lawn activities, being a non a non unit peripheral function of the school. Um, but yeah, so I, I I think he was kind of there saying no one talks to each other, and I was here saying let's all walk for our well being and. Um, Mark Fisher was very much a part of um, putting events on, um, led me to the archives. In the archives, you find this rich history about AA carnival events that used to happen. You have Throbbing Gristle playing in giant Coca-Cola cans. You've got Pink Floyd playing at AA. You've got Fleetwood Mac playing at AA. Um, you've just got these weird parties, basically. Um, and I think anyone that values a weird party is, is someone I'd like to be friends with. So it kind of came to this point where, oh, let's call it AA Carnival. Let's reignite whatever the carnival was. The carnival is a, a moment of topsy-turvy. It's kind of reversing the general order of things. It's a good way to critique any politic or institution or place. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the event became a walk around the school. Um, and I thought, if how, you know, how do you get a body of a line of people walking together? Uh, we're going to need some costumes, some lights, some sound, et cetera. So we, fans, we have all of this, but you're gonna need something as well. So the choreographic object in this case becomes a 23 and a half meter long, I think he was, uh, inflatable. Um, I should mention John Walter's influence on this whole affair because he was my tutor in my fifth, in my second year at AA when I was doing this event. Um, and he very much stood for this idea that the artist is an antenna, you put yourself in the middle of your work, um, he's very good at borrowing tropes, icons, things, and just slamming them all together. He's another maximalist. Um, so somehow his tutelage led me to the idea of a mascot. And a mascot is some, some sort of voluptuous character we can all get behind. You know, it's, it's some sort of silly face of the thing. Um, so then, you know, the, the choreographic object I need is a mascot. It's a parade float. It's a Chinese dragon, whatever you want to call it. Again, in the archives at the AA, you see the students have in the past have made Chinese dragons and marched down to the Chelsea Arts Club Ball. Um, then the design of the object starts, and that's when it gets quite interesting from design terms. Um, because he's he's long for a reason. He's long to unite a procession, but he's also long because then he has to, um, you know, de, de facto be in multiple rooms at once. He's in the lecture hall, but he's also wrapping up the stairs and he's in the front members room. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an unavoidable fact of being very long in a mm -hmm. confined space. Um, he's also an inflatable, so he can squash, he can fit through doors, he can be deformed, he's not gonna break. Um, this ripstop nylon he's made of is incredibly tough stuff. You'll, you'll have a problem ripping through it, hence the name. Um, he's very bright, he's very loud and he, you can't, oh yeah, this is the other nice thing I think conceptually about the toad. Mm -hmm. is uh, you wouldn't be able to move him alone. He doesn't work alone. Mm -hmm. He's got four air inlets, so he's only staying inflated if you've got four people feeding him air. Um, he'll snag on everything. He's got loads of appendages and arms and bits coming off him, so he's, he's going to get snagged on a door frame unless someone is guiding him. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, everyone's sort of forced to work together, forced to be around the school, forced to travel through the whole school, also says care towards this object and to, to, towards the environment. Um, and commonality as well, you know, uh, no one really knew. Well, that's the lovely thing about carnival. There isn't a purpose by definition. You know, the carnival is the time when we don't have a purpose. It's the, the least productive moment of our lives and therefore the most celebratory. Um, play in excess and wastage and all of this, these ideas. Um, this is the nice thing about play is it's, it has to be wasteful to be play. It can't be productive. Otherwise, you're not playing. You're doing something else. Um, but you're right, there's a duty of care for a mascot, which actually represents care for each other and unity and suddenly dissolving of all these fiefdoms and it's suddenly saying, oh, there is one body of people and one toad um, and dozens and dozens of rooms and five levels of building and a whole school, but all... And we all came there. We all came together. That was such a beautiful moment because all the people, all... Our friends from Oxford Brooks were there, but then everyone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Naturally, I had to invite everyone I knew. And... Members. So then everyone from the AA was there. So there was this real cross pollination that was happening as a result of this event. I th yeah, I, because when you have um, so long to work on a project, uh, when you're a student, you afford yourself the time to be 
pursuing your own ends you know that's that's why it's worth the money I, I would say but um you work that long on something and you, you I wrote an essay about it I wrote a poem about it we built a toad around it as costumes as you know dozens of meetings the the logbook I made of the event was actually a record of meetings and mm -hmm. conversations you know it was the kind of paper version of the free school of you know it was very much in the interest of who had to talk to who to make this work that that's the evidence of the event um you know famously I never get the right photo of anything so the evidence had to be paper trail memory kind of based thing um lots of people took photos of it I, certainly I have a bunch somewhere wasn't there it was a it was a green toad but then there was a pink section of it yeah so there was a donut um yeah toad, toad was greedy and bloated so he'd swallowed a donut um as greedy bloated things do um green yeah i'm glad you brought up green i think um color was the sort of first thing you know famously you can unite a project or a work or a book you know talk to any graphic designer uh, a footnote in bright orange will a book make you know unified um so i, I think splashing the school full of a, a single color of light is always a good idea on event day um but i kind of got carried away with green i think um day glow green there, there was a great talk at the AA. I, I don't remember who he was unfortunately but someone had the good idea of bringing in a magician to the school who told us amongst other things that magicians were responsible for dozens of great inventions one of them being day glow color or fluorescent color mm -hmm. uh, because they're masters of attention they, they they sort of know exactly what you're going to look at and when um everything from sleight of hand to inventing colors brighter than any before so the day glow day glow set of orange green pink and yellow mm -hmm. i'm sort of looking at those as bright the brightest colors i can find and green somehow maybe it comes out of the toad i don't know i just before then i think um um there was one picture i had on up in the studio at the time it was the queen second time i've mentioned the, the queen of england or the commonwealth uh this talk but um she was pictured not long before that in a kind of fluorescent green suit and hat yes uh, and i saw that and i just thought that was absolutely wicked she looked like a high-vis queen um you know well, that was a remarkable outfit yeah uh, brave how brave i know it, it's so incongruous like the, the great thing about these colors is they stand out put a day glow green in front of buckingham palace and the first thing you think about is maintenance guy or you know temporary thing or um a green screen so mm. she was then replaced with all sorts of other sort of patterns yeah the, the misuse is crazy right um put her in anything you want if she's wearing that um it is brave um so yeah the color identity is was a big part of it why he had pink donut um i think there was a sort of um there was a rational reason i mean it was one thing i've discovered in baby clothes is quite a neat design thing you have buttons traveling up the inside of the leg under the crotch and down the other leg and you can get and then the buttons also go up the center line of the very chest small babies. very small babies yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um but you often put the wrong popper on the wrong thing and you end up in the wrong place you know one above the other so one of the poppers has got a copper colored coating on it oh to give it to guide yes yeah, yeah. so you know that you're not going left instead of right or whatever the case may be i think there was a logic like that in the pink um it was also a gorgeous pink mm -hmm. there's always a conceit in a project i mm -hmm. think the conceit here was pink is gorgeous so i have to use a bit of it um well the conceit is like well i'm having a mascot and i get to decide what he is and he's a toad and he's green and he's long um you, you need a you can talk about the rationality behind a project. Did, did the toad actually have a head with eyes and things? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you're in the habit of adding um, picture annotations to these videos. I won't, no. No, too, okay. So too much effort. I'll try and describe him then. He's he's a long line. I have to describe him. That's the, that's the beauty of this format. His his head is a big lolling tongue. You know, the tongue is the bit yeah. that makes you uh, grotesque and absurd and silly and dribbly. But his head just turns into a tongue. His head is a giant tongue. And then he, he has got a couple of eyes because they're quite a prominent toady feature. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
uh, he swallowed a donut. So then you get this giant pink donut shaped neck piece. Um, at several points along him, he's got little toady feet hanging off. I think he's got three legs because you, you can't have two. That would be too logical. Um, he's also got pint glasses on his back, like, like mm. um, dragon spikes almost. He's got a big belly at some point, which is just a big orb. Mm. He also has a football in his body. There's a perfect dodecahedron because uh, he's a football fan. The football fans... I'm not going to go there. They're the ultimate pilgrims. They make a weekly pilgrimage to the stadium and shout and roar and wear the same uniform. They're, they're a wonderful bunch of pilgrims. Um, there's more legs. Uh, you, you're about two thirds of the way along. Um, what else has he got? And then, well, at some point, his tail just splits into three because he predominantly he's a sort of uh, 900 millimeter diameter tube. And you can't just end in a end so his, his his tail sort of splits off into three to curve he allows him to enter rooms to different rooms at the same time or um or come out through a window and then back in as he mm. was traveling around the school yeah he literally spent half of the parade going forward and the second half going backwards mm -hmm. um that was a nice moment in, in planning the event you um, anyone familiar with the AA or studied there, eventually you come across all these maps and the maps tell you where Dip 7 is and where you go to an exhibition and they try and explain things through maps. And it is a nice plan, you know, it's it's a Georgian terrace in plan form with a back building and, you know, it's, it's all over the place. You can connect in different ways and different levels. It's almost like a platform game. Um, so yeah, at some point I'm sitting down on the plan and thinking, where is everyone going to begin? Where do we get a moment to sort of burst out the front of the school where do we get a moment to cross from one building to another at which bit should we go up and down in section yeah. yes. um so at some point yeah he ends up in the front members room which has a recently renovated uh crystal chandelier in it which they didn't want me to go in at some point but um the great thing about the carnival is it's like a green card to do anything you want because you find them that the purpose is to be um antagonistic and to challenge the constriction of the school in whatever way so there was a crit growing going on in a back room and they said you can't do your parade in this room we have a crit that evening and i said that's the point we're meant to disrupt you there's a crystal chandelier in this room you can't bring your inflatable here what if it gets knocked that's the point we're meant to bring a, a bit of risk in here that chandelier is too precious anyway um so yeah he, he stuck his nose out the school and then the only real trajectory from there is to start going backwards Okay. Yeah. Uh, so he did end up coming out backwards, which he ended up coming out, coming in front of the school, right? Yeah, he ends up on the street, and you know, so you get your nice moment with the elevation of the school, which is all illuminated. Picture for, for the yeah, top. you get your photo moment, um, but also you get some, you get to see the whole thing for the first time. I think that's actually quite, yeah. Yeah. you know. Uh, so before then, no one. I just actually remembered speaking about it. I just remembered that uh, the toad came out because I was trying to, um, to to remember it as a whole, and I couldn't. And I guess it being outside was was actually the toad wasn't the main person. I remember everything else and everyone else, but not not the not the shape of the toad. And with but isn't that wonderful? It's yeah, because everyone. People always say, oh, your frog, your dragon, your snake. And no one remembers it was a toad. And I don't really blame them because at no point did anyone see a toad. Yeah. Even when you could have seen him fully stretched out to the naked eye, he doesn't look like a toad. He's got some kind of grotesque features. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's like my earlier point. You could ask a designer to try and draw Lewis Bonfire Night as a plan or, or whatever. He's, they're never going to capture it. You've got, in events, you have time to work with and you have... <laughs> Another aspect of that work, and it's interesting that you earlier mentioned the graphic design as a, almost as an inspiration of sorts. Uh, but um, what's interesting that is that in that piece of design, there were also these posters that were placed around the school and they, they offered another angle. Hmm. I think um, this is something I haven't yet reconciled with in my work is the place of words. Mm -hmm. um, and writing and dare I say poetry or slogan or something um it's terribly important I always like writing but it's the least obvious kind of art form mm -hmm. I'm jealous of the poet in fact because or the novelist because everything gets poured into this 
beautifully simple singular products you know you end up with this book and you don't end up with a mess and 18 gigabytes of random shit on your hard drive and scraps of paper and three different sketchbooks with five different projects in them and um so words are i th i think they're intrinsically aimed at um concision if that's a word being concise um the posters for me they weren't trying to be cryptic but they are trying to be shorthand and they are trying to be as succinct as possible so you can spend an hour of your life coming up with three words in a certain order and see that as a really effective way to communicate mm -hmm. i don't you know famously we're, we're at our most boring when you try to describe to someone what the dream you had last night was which i I'm always doing to my poor partner. I did it this morning. And every time you try to describe a dream, you just realize words aren't enough. I can't, I don't know what image you're getting of my dream, but it certainly wasn't the dream I was having. And I, I accept that limitation. So the words have to mean something else. They have to stand in their own simple, basic, limited way. Um, and then you start to game that. You realize, you realize the limitation and then you work with it, I guess. Um, so all these slogans, yeah, they said, take a walk, uh, round and round. Uh, there was a graphic design. There's an enjoyment of the shape of letters on a page as well. Round and round was cropped in a certain way that it was almost palindromic or symmetrical mm -hmm. over three lines. Um, take a walk is a nice example. That was, it said, one, take a walk. The A's in take and er sort of line through to spell out AA. So you kind of know where you are. It's the AA's writ large there, the architectural association that is. Um, yeah, I, th I think letters are very pretty things. Words are really powerful. They're certainly not a substitute for it. And that's, I, th I think it's a, um, a nice observation you make that they are a kind of different channel of the same work. Mm -hmm. um, so you have so many, you have so many tools. Um, um, well, I just said, for example, I'm, I'm jealous of the, the person who has one tool and uses it fully yeah. the writer who makes the book and the book is there um, but maybe that's because i'm talking from an outside perspective and i'm not the writer and i don't how, how do you reconcile the tools the writing the line which is the metal the 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 event this is definitely the one i can't answer i don't know where it's going I think this is it though it's the it's the crux and I, I like plurality I, I don't want to arrive at one tool um and each tool at the moment does something different to the other as mm -hmm. I was saying about words I was talking very differently about what words meant to me than what um a bar of steel means to me um so I'd, I'd be a fool to try and you know thin out my toolbox as it were uh, and I, I do think, yeah, the, the nice thing about the um, old Ken Toad's parade event was all these tools felt sort of in equanimity. Mm -hmm. You never saw the whole Toad, you never saw all the posters, you never, nobody ever realized everything. So it's just a bit for everybody. Um, we see the small 3D printed um, feet. Yeah, yeah there was yeah, the little token. Pilgrim, you know, that was the Pilgrim's token. Um, the person who had traveled and had something to show for it. So that's what I mean. I think, he, he, I, I think again, I'd mentioned John Walter here as, as kind of his delightful maximalism. It's about layering, 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 layering. It's ironic, really, because a lot of my work tries to be as simple as possible mm -hmm. um, in itself, but it's part of a set, it's part of a toolkit that's broader. One, one last piece of that toolkit that I feel we should talk about and it's something that finally has emerged uh, very recently is the site being a thing to address and mm -hmm. you install this uh, beautiful work somewhere in scotland um, mm. Vancouver on the, on the river tay in a little town called newport on tay opposite dundee mm. and how was that how was that experience the, this experience of screwing steel into stone and letting it just be there and stay there stay behind mm. be stored permanently I, I think you've hit the nail on the head it was um a little bit surreal I mean 
Yeah, it's the first sculpture that I have bolted to a place and expect to stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly beyond even the occupation of the owners of the house. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, I, I made another big steel thing for a, another of Stefan's dances, and that was displayed in Kingston upon Thames for a while. So we had to anchor that into the ground. Um, but these were just uh, uh, rebar anchors going into earth. So any strong drunken person could come along and probably get it out of the ground without too much effort. But yeah, bolting this to a um, almost a, a glorified man-made rock face, it, it was quite nice. I think the irony is that I don't like stuff that doesn't move. And this thing still moves. It's a, a sculpture with a pendulum action, uh, kinetic sculpture, if you will. Um, I, I always feel really subservient to sites though. I don't, one thing I don't like about architecture is the permanence of it often. Um, well, I say that new architecture, I should add as a little caveat. Um, mm. Architects do such grandiose, heavy, environmentally destructive things as if it's a given and it must be done. And you talk to anyone around you and you'll find a number in the crowd would always say, I don't think that should have been put there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, a, it's very undemocratic architecture and it's very permanent and heavy and uh, often involving a load of planet destroying mass. Mm -hmm. So putting a steel object, bolting it to a lovely Scottish riverfront location in an, an area of outstanding natural beauty um, did feel a bit wrong. But I think that's where scale comes in. A bit wrong, no, I not, not um, in an overall way, as in a in a principal way. Um, I'm really excited that it's going to live there. I'm very excited as a sculptor and fulfilled even that there is a sculpture in the world that is bolted to its site and will remain rocking. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's not too big. It's invisible. I think the, the nice thing about a river is you can go to the other side and look across it. So I obviously, the first time I went there to visit the site and to meet the owners of the house, et cetera, um, I went over to Dundee and the first thing I naturally did was try and peer over the river. I was like, which house was it? Which bank is it? And oh, wait, you, so you went to the site before you built the object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the architect's um, in me was um, the idea of not visiting a site and designing something for it is anathema, you know. Uh, that that would be a kind of how, how was that Robert Joe responding to the site? So I yeah, this is where I can answer your question, and I believe in my answer, but I don't think it's perfect yet. This is something I can work on as I continue to work. Um, again, it's quite it's more of an architectural answer than an artistic one. There's a there's formal nods, you know. There's a certain language of steel. Um, the sculpture uses a mixture of of round section, square section steel. Um, to pick up on on the sort of cast iron rail bridge that exists on the site, to pick up on the decommissioning towers. They have this huge, great riverfront industry, you know, and to a lot of people, that's quite exciting, you know, hardware, industrial hardware. So there's a, there's a little bit of nod to that. The finish of it is rusted. Um, in fact, you'd be a fool not to let it rust. Um, I went to visit Kango Kuma's v &A Dundee projects. There's quite a lot of stainless steel balustrading and bits around the site, even that's rusty in this location. So you'd mm -hmm. have to use a really high carbon content stainless steel to avoid rusting. So you, in that sense, yes, it's it's robust, it's steel, it's already rusted, it's mm -hmm. kind of got a nod to some of the industry, but everything I've so far said is very um, anthropocentric, you know, it's very much the man-made part of the site. Mm -hmm. um, there is one unrealized part of the sculpture um, which was aiming to respond to the tide of the river because uh, we're all basically at an estuary at this point. So it, it does rise and fall hugely. Um, and that was the front of the sculpture is um, cantilevering over the edge of a terrace built onto the hillside. Um, and it has these little hoops and things on it. And my, my idea was always that this would be right on the water edge and that off these hoops, you could hang chains and ropes um, the guy who's what the, the the man in the couple who owned the house, um, he basically spent his COVID lockdown doing this, you know, building these steps down to the waterfront, making nice places to sit, clearing away old plants. You know, it's, it's a landscaping project in retirement and in a lovely way. He's done an amazing job. Um, 
but he was he he told me about gathering driftwood he'd sort of lob in his grappling hook and his rope mm -hmm. see a log coming down he'd run down with his rope and sort of like fish it in and somehow use it in his garden um so the again it's a very man-made relation to a river though isn't it this idea that it's a a resource or something to to gather from so as much as i'd like to yeah this project certainly is not um a rebalance of nature and man it's, it's certainly a dominion project mm -hmm. um, but there's a slowness to the motion there's a pendulum there's a tide there's a um a sort of softness to something quite heavy which i think is of a sort of riverine rugged scottish landscape as well mm -hmm. um, this isn't bright green it's not because of its permanence it's not one of these um belching bloating burping toads in day glow color it's a, a sort of slow heavy soft pensive object of not overwhelming scale in a little slice of a riverside um and you know in particular there's a, a kind of seat around it with a big stone back so at some point it's it's a filter between you and a sunset mm -hmm. and so it does just say uh, a person has made a calm spot here to enjoy the river Mm -hmm. And this somehow, like a bookmark of that moment in that person's story, mm -hmm. sits there and says that this is intentional. We're, we're meant to be here. We're meant to enjoy this, and we're meant to. This is a place. It's a form of uh, acknowledging the moment and place. Mm -hmm. There's there's one part of it which is a, a steel semisphere, which yes. is at the back, yes. um, which will obviously catch rain. Yeah, uh, and it's three millimeters thick, mild steel. Um, so I, I think one nice, there, there's evolution there is what I'm saying, that will sit with water in it for a couple of decades and at some point it will rust through. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, then time will be known by the sculpture in terms of its ability to withstand rust and, and rain. Mm -hmm. So I, I quite like that part of it. I think there's a bit of a preemptive decay mm -hmm. built in. Because metal is a earthly material, uh, and um, you've developed this relationship to metal, you you understand it. You understand it. You understand it technically, really, as well as formally, what you can do with it. It is lovely. I love the steel I work with. This the one inch pipe, which I mostly use, twenty five point four mil diameter. Um, it's a very good scale for body weight because um, I bend it all using various manual bending tools, whether it's a kind of plumber's bender or a, a feed bender. Um, and a three meter long one inch pipe on a couple of bricks, it's got an amazing buoyancy in it. it I don't know, yeah, I, I think I, when I work with it, I do feel like a little bit of a dancer. You, you have to, when you work alone, we're talking about working alone, I, I always end up using a foot somewhere up in the air and I'm holding on to something while I'm trying to weld it. And you're relying on these magnets that have a pull. So it's got this magnetic quality. It's kind of like, a, it's kind of like fudge. It's very ductile, mild steel. Um, so it, it can, receive, even when you cut through it with a grinder, it gets so hot that when you start the cut, it's kind of grating. And when you get through to the other side of the pipe, it's almost like it's softened into a hard cheese or something, you know? So I've, I've got a lot, I think, and as you, as anyone does with any tool or any material, you get a slow growing relationship. And I, I look forward to that relationship blooming more in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is such nice stuff. It's so soft in its own way and mm -hmm. forgiving and robust and unprecious. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and, there is, and there is weight. There, there, there is this, uh, I think it's a real like, also conversation with gravity. <laughs> with the forces of uh, that pull us down yeah the heavier something is the kind of slower it moves mm -hmm. uh, that extends to the pendulum the more weight you put on the pendulum the, the longer it will rock mm -hmm. and that's just a you're right i don't think about gravity much but it's it's kind of writ large um i'm sitting on i've just noticed this table's got a wobble because i'm sitting on a table i made of steel and i didn't brace the legs very well so and that's, that's uh, very fitting i think yes i'm sorry if i'm uh ruining your audience experience here but it, well, it's exactly it's the a, a rotational kind of uh misbalance table. um yeah i think this is under two years old it's a big 
big circular top and all right steel legs again there's always a practical consideration this only oh, gets to my flat if the legs are dismantleable <laughs> so it's it's got a kind of bicycle style flange connection oh, right. very good and what's the little one behind you? Is that um, the cable one that you mentioned? Oh, no. This, this is more typical of, um, yeah, I make a, a bunch like this. These are the more figurative ones. Yeah. Know. Are they sketches or are they, um, or they are objects, they are finished objects? Yeah. They are, well, yeah, relatively finished objects. Uh, some of them even get painted. This is actually the one I mentioned. I, I use this as a coaster. Okay. Okay. This, this great. Next to my sofa as a as a amazing. Just like a tea, cup of tea or a... exactly glass of water right there. 